Good morning. <clears throat> Today we'll finish off what well, we're going to cover on power screws. And then uh, I'll make some comments about the upcoming final. So the root diameter <coughs> is the diameter inside the threads. This is the power screw. The root diameter is down inside here. Okay. The diameter to the <coughs> exterior of the threads is the major diameter or outer diameter D. The mean diameter is the average of these two. Why these threads look like as follows. P upon two is the pitch. It's the distance from the front of this thread to the front of the next thread. It's spread equally at the midpoint to these sides into P upon two. And the <clears throat> depth of the thread is also P upon two. So to this outer part here, this would be D, the major diameter by two, but to the inner part, center line, so this distance P upon two is D upon two minus DR, so P is simply D minus DR. There's an angle here. Psi Most common thread used in power screws is a standard Acme thread, in which case this angle is 14.5 degrees. 
and it's zero for a square thread. Square threads are still used. Lead that left paper up some, please. Sorry, yeah, can you push that uh, last paper up some, please? So we, it's hard to focus on it. Is that it? Is that okay? Uh, yeah, that'll work. Thank you. Thank you. For most power screws, you have a single thread. So the lead, which is the amount, the, th <clears throat> the threaded piece advances with one rotation is equal to P. On the other hand, if you do have a double thread, And we computed the torque in and the weight lifted out relationship, just a piece of static. W is the total load or the total force being applied. You can think of it as the weight of, the, of a load being lifted, but it could just be the force of a block being compressed. Gems this mean diameter. This is for loading. You could say loading up or applying load. Is that FL or PL? Yeah, that's F. Uh, you're, just you're looking away, then, then it's loading up and it's moving it up. But in generally, you, you don't have these things necessarily in the vertical plane. They could be horizontal. And so this is when you're applying the load. This is the torque W. In this form an F, this, these are both Fs. It's a coefficient of friction. Dr. Sinclair, could yep. you elaborate on uh, what that big W means again? Oh, yeah. Well, I think when I first introduced it, I talked about W and lifting a weight, okay, with a power screw. But when you have this thing here, if you put something in here and you tighten it up, And W is the is the just simply the force that's been applied to this thing. Okay, so it's not a weight at all. Now, if if I had this thing down low and I was trying to lift this in a vertical plane like this, then it would be the weight. And so that's how I introduced it. But in general, it, W is just the the load that's been applied to, to whatever <clears throat> is at the end of the power screw. And the torque is what I'm doing down here with this thing here. That's the torque that's been applied. It's the force times this length now. Okay. Thank you. So you certainly can use these things to lift heavy things, but you can use them to apply serious compressive force. I mean, you're using it to lift things when you have it in the car. Okay, you're lifting 
lifting the uh, the car. But you could just be compressing something with these things. When you unload, you have a change of sign for T and a change of sign for F. And so when you do that, you get the following. <clears throat> this is unloading. Now, when you're unloading, if you were lifting a weight, this would stay constant. If you're compressing a block of material, this would reduce as you <clears throat> took the strain off. Okay, so the W would be varying. So, <clears throat> if you have to apply a torque to unload, then the, the device is self locking. That means it, it doesn't <clears throat> just wind backwards unless you're holding it. Okay, and this, this is a piece you want. So, you want this to be greater than naught. So you really do have to apply a torque to unload it. So that means we have self-locking. You don't have to keep applying a torque once you've got the load that you want if F is big enough. Well, you divide three by here, it means F greater than or equal to L cos I divided by pi dm. Now we did have in developing these things, we had <clears throat> tan of lambda, where well, lambda was the angle of inclination of the thread to the section. We had a, a relationship for that. And I just substituted for that. Tan lambda was L upon pi dm. You, you almost don't have, that turns out to be about five degrees for most power screws. Power screws. You don't really need to work that out. I just substituted for that in these formulas. These are probably more convenient versions. Well, we can talk about efficiency now. Dr. Sinclair, is that F greater than or equal to? Yes. And that's coefficient of friction, correct? Sorry? That's the coefficient of friction, correct? Yes, yes, yes. So you have to have a certain amount of friction for it to lock, okay? If, if you don't, if F equals naught, then this T is negative. So you have to supply a torque to stop it going down. It means the weight itself is going to drive the thing down, okay? Or the load itself is going to, going to uh, provide the torque. We're going to define the efficiency as the work out of the work in. You could define the efficiency as the power out of the power in. It'll be the same. This will just be work out per unit time, work in per unit time. So it'll, it'll be the same. But the work out is if you wind the thing through one turn, then you apply this load W over a length L. So that's the work out. In the meantime, what have you done? You've applied a torque and you've applied it for one rotation by two pi. So if we go to loading up, have this formula here, we'll substitute for this. Oh, let, me, let me say this for loading up.
Is that t times 2 pi? Yes, times 2 pi, yes. OK, thank you. So I substitute for t. Put the two pi in front. And t times this. With this on the top. Well, these twos cancel, as does the W. So here's a formula for E. What causes the efficiency to be less than perfect is friction. That's where you lose work <coughs> overcoming friction rather than getting it out. So if you put F equal to zero here, these two terms here, we pi dm cos xi, we pi dm cos xi, and the L's would cancel. So if F equals naught, then E equals one. Okay. So that, that, on the other hand, as F goes up, and E goes down. So what, in terms of getting as much work out as possible, we want a low F. On the other hand, we, when we have these power screws, we do want we want a big enough F that the device self locks. If there's a C clamp, if I tighten it up and it wasn't self locking, when I took my hand off, it would start coming unlocked. Okay, we don't want that. Let me let me demonstrate these formulas on example. So for this C clamp that we've analyzed already to a degree, I'm going to go and find out what the mechanical, excuse me, mechanical advantage is. That'll be the force out divided by the force in and how efficient it is or otherwise. It's obviously not going to be perfectly efficient. Here are, here are the specs that we had before. The average or mean diameter was 35 over 64. The lead, it was a single thread, it was the same as the pitch, and that was five over 32. It was a standard Acme thread. T, torque, is F times L. 
this length here, you know, prior to the force here, is a little bit more than three inches. Prior to the force just inside that, I'm going to say this little L is about three inches. It adds to the mechanical advantage. You can put a longer lever arm on that and get some more mechanical advantage. I don't have the coefficient of friction for my C clamp, but I went online and looked up for a, mine, mine's a five eighths inch C clamp. Uh, I found F for a half inch C clamp is 0.12. Okay. From, <clears throat> that was what the uh, manufacturer gave me. So we're going to adopt that. And I don't know if you remember this, but last time we calculated what the self locking uh, F needed to be, it was 0 0.088. So this is greater than. 0.09, so that implies it's self-locking. Then what we want to know out of here is W over F, the applied force, my, <coughs> sorry, the force acting at the head of the thread, and this is the applied force F. Any efficiency. So an answer to this F was T over L. And then we had a relationship between T. It's our relationship between T and W, so I'm going to substitute for that. So now we'll put the numbers in. And let's leave this at W. L was three inches, so two times L is six. DM is 35 over 64. Now L is five over 32. Minus pi dm 35 over 64 times this 0.12. Pi dm, the same thing here, and cos 14.5 minus. Sorry, this is plus, my mistake, minus down here, minus F 0 0.12 times L, which is 5 upon 32. You can simplify this by multiplying through by 64. Six times 64 is 384. I multiply by three by six and four, I'll get 10. Cost 14.5, and I get plus. Oops. And on the bottom, likewise, pi 35. And this will be if, 10 times um, 1.2 is minus 
So I did this calculation before class. You can see that this is about a tenth, but this here is about a this is 35 upon 384. And this is 22 upon 105. I'll give you these numbers. This is about one upon 10, this is one upon five. So F is W upon 50.5. That's a significant mechanical advantage. You can rewrite this. That means suppose W equals a thousand pounds and F is about 20 pounds. So you can lift a thousand pounds with 20 pounds, which you comply with your fingers. Mechanical advantage is certainly significant when you get an order of magnitude. With this, you could easily get two orders of magnitude. If you made the the uh, little crank handle, this thing here, six inches long, that would get you 100 to one. So these devices have serious mechanical advantages. Let's get what the efficiency is. Now, this had a low coefficient of friction, low in the following sense. Was 0.12 compared to 0.09 is what I need for self-locking. So, <clears throat> assuming that that manufacturer's spec applies to my C-clamp, which is not a reasonable assumption, but nonetheless an assumption, then we can go calculate the efficiency, and we've got a low carbon. So E, I'll just repeat the formula we had before. So we substituting the numbers in, the lead was five over 32. DM was 35 over 64. This is still the same 14.5 degrees. Coverage and friction 0.12. DM again, 35 over 64. Well, I'm not gonna put, do any more of the calculations here. I calculated this before, this is 0.42 or 42%. So we've got an efficiency that's less than 50%, okay? Even with quite a good coefficient of friction. So, despite the low F, you can't get a lot, much lower F on this and have it be self-locking. You could get some, but, but not much. So these things are not efficient. So that's one of the reasons you don't want to use them over and over again you're going to be putting a lot more energy in than you're getting out, a lot more work in than you're getting out. Okay. On the other hand, for one-off operations, they're very good. Are there any questions on that? Okay, well, let's look at what some of the 
There's another aspect of this that's in the homework. There's a little bit more talk in the column. Here's the and it there can be a color. That fits in here. And this provides a flat surface that contacts with whatever you want to apply the pressure to. And <clears throat> by having this color, you can change the size of this relative to the size of your thread. And that's what happens here. So this, this color that they put on here has, oh, about a one inch diameter. So it's, it's significantly bigger than the diameter uh, of this and applies the force over a bigger area. It also sort of matches the area of this. No, they're not quite actually, this, this is bigger still. Okay. That's the reason for doing this. So <clears throat> in this particular case, there's a contact diameter. So it's contacting inside this little uh, hole here. And if FC then I'm going to have an increment, an additional torque. To overcome and it's going to be W times FC which is the frictional force times the moment arm which is DC upon two and what you do you replace T by T plus delta T and you do this whether you're going up or down that this thing will add to the torque up or down the book gives some appreciable values in your homework for DC. And what they're doing is they've got their collar fixed to this here, okay? And so it's spinning between the collar, the motion uh, occurs between the collar and the load, okay? And so it's DC would be out here. And since you usually make these collars big, DC can be big. That, that's unusual. Uh, uh, it's in a couple of examples in the book, but this is a much more usual way of doing it where you try to reduce the friction by having the, the motion here. This thing say stuck to the load and, and the motion occurs here. So let, let's see what happens with the, with the C clamp. But sometimes for some of the problems and problems at uh, nine, which have book values, that this, this will not be insignificant, but this is usually small. Not necessarily negligible, but, I, but sometimes just ignored. So if we do the C clamp, well, the people making the C clamp, they don't need this to be self locking. Okay, in fact, they don't want, so they can have a lower coefficient of friction than 0.12. So let's just say we take F equals um, half of that, 0.06. So we've done something to ensure that these surfaces 
um, can slide relatively easily. Okay. Then T plus of this thing here is going to be W over 50.5. Plus this this thing here, W I measured the I got the diameter of this here, and that diameter was uh, seven thirty seconds, and I figured that the the effective contact would be about half of that. So that comes seven over sixty-four. Okay. Now that's just an estimate, okay? But there'll be contact stresses all the way out here, and, and maybe you can take seven over thirty-two, but that would not—that would be an overestimate, okay? Let me calculate this. So why did you do half the diameter? I'll, I'll show you a second. But 003. So it's not quite an order of magnitude less than no. this. And that, that that's ballpark what it, what it would be if you design these things properly. Okay, let me, let me explain um, that. that, that that's question. a good question. So you've got this round surface contact in here. Okay. That, <clears throat> that will give you uh, you're trying to get a moment from this. That'll give you a contact stress that looks like this. Okay, so I get the result in force and I want, it's it's moment arm. I, I said the moment arm was halfway through here. It's just a rough estimate, but it's not, certainly not all the way on the outside. Even if it was uniform, Then this would be halfway the resultant. Okay, if you're trying to replace it, the resultant force would be halfway. Okay. So the half mightn't be quite correct. It might even be less than that. It, it, it's going to look like this. And if you <clears throat> found where the resultant force was for this half of this pressure, it would probably be a little bit further inside. For this sort of pressure, uniform pressure, the resultant force is exactly here. So this would be. That, that's effectively where it acts, okay? And that's where, it, that's its moment arm, therefore. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, for but, but, it, but, it's, but let me tell you, what I did here is just approximate. I mean, I could have done this more carefully, and in which case it would have reduced this. I did measure this 730 second uh, reasonably accurately. So that, that number is okay, but this is probably a little bit generous. Yep, what was, what was the other um, question? You have uh, T plus equals W of 50.5. Yes. Um, didn't we calculate F equal W over 50.5, not the torque? Uh, let's see, that, that, that'll be the same, okay? Uh, oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, no, you're quite right. No, you're quite right. Um, let's see, I've got to multiply. Yeah, no, you're quite right. Uh, thank you. So, T would have been, um, this would be divided by three. Because, because F, <clears throat> you'd, uh, T equals FL, so F equals T upon L, okay? So, so this should have been 16.8. Point oh six, okay. Three three times, all right. And so th this is uh, an order of magnitude less, okay. and that that's typically the case. Okay. Thank you for that comment. Okay. And and so quite often you you don't worry about this. Now, as I said, the book has this thing stuck here, and it's turning here, so it's DC is way out here, and so it it starts to add a little bit more. Not a lot, but some more. Yeah. Okay.
But it's not talking about stresses. rough sketch of this power through. Core stresses, I mean, in the central core of the, of the thread, uh, not the thread itself. And I mean, when it's um, not in contact with these, and there's this low W, then on the, Bottom here, we're applying a torque T. Okay. And so there's an axial compressive stress. And this is when the threads are not in contact. Well, let's call that somewhere A. It's minus W upon A, it's compressive. Uh, for A, DR is the root diameter. So we're going to take A. This case, sigma A this this is conservative overestimate. Why is that? Well, you, you never have a part of this where you just get DR. You always see some part of the thread. Even when I went across here, I'd see this part of the thread. So the actual area looks like this. All right. And it's ellipse. And what we've done is we removed this material here and made it a circle. So this is conservative. Now, the book makes a slightly peculiar comment about this. It, it says that these uh, stresses are not uniform and that they're small, okay? Uh, neither statement is correct. When you're in contact with the thread, there'll be some, some distribution of this axial stress, which is not uniform. That is true, okay? Okay, it, out here where it's got no contact, It'll be pretty close to uniform. But say for nonce principles, it will be uniform when you get far enough away from where we're applying the load and we're applying up in this thread. So, so that statement about it will not be uniform is not uniformly correct. It is partially correct. And actually, th this is not that small a stress. We'll do some numbers and we'll see. And so I don't quite know why they said that, but maybe if they'd done some calculations, they'd realize it wasn't right.
And then the second read course, uh, course verse is due to the talk. And we'll do the same thing again. We'll treat this, this section. Now, the section is also outside the thread. Okay. So it's going to be fifteen T upon pi, and we'll do the same thing. DRQ. And here, here's the fundamental reason why this is going to be comparable to this. Okay, not small. It's because W is much bigger than F times L, okay? Because of the mechanical advantage and power screws. So it, it, it's false to think this is gonna be small compared to this. It could be, but I haven't seen it. Now, by and large with these things, you don't use them that often. Fatigue is potentially a problem, but it's less so. And what you try to do is to keep, keep your maximum shear down below about half your yield strength, and these, these things will operate pretty much forever. So the peak shear then in the in the in the course dresses well it's going to be <clears throat> combination of this axial stress with this so tau max is sigma a upon two plus tau t squared. If you link this out, you'll get a certainly different tau max. Okay. That's why upon two means there'd be no gross yielding. You might well have a safety factor in designing this here, but you'd certainly want to be as well. That's the Trescott condition, which is easy to use. There's a peak compressive stress which it can be large. Well, you had single one, two is, is the average normal stress plus or minus tau max the average normal stress is negative so this is the peak compressive stress sigma 2 would be sigma a that's negative divided by 2 minus tau max and that can be quite large but this is the key that is keeping the maximum shear down okay are there any questions on that Okay, let's take a break for five minutes. We may finish a little earlier today, and I'll, I'll talk about thread split. Okay.
Now to complete the picture on stresses, we'll talk, <clears throat> talk about a really simplified treatment of thread stresses. These stresses were all nominal stresses, they weren't local, but out where the core is not in contact, that they're a reasonably accurate picture of what's going on. Except for the fact that we took DR and we slightly overestimated them. I'm going to keep this simple, but the idea is the same. I'm going to take a square thread. And if it's not in contact, then there's really no, <clears throat> no stress is induced. So we have to have it in contact. With the host thread. And at least initially, we're going to be dealing with nominal stresses. So here's a square thread. And there's some kind of bearing stress pushing down here. That's compressive. And then this is a very stubby little beam. So sigma B will be bending stress. And in order to design these things or understand the design, since they're not frequently used, what you want to do is avoid yielding. So we're going to want what tau max is. So these are three things we're going to look at. There's bearing stress. Well, it's going to be the load over the area. We don't really know how much of the load goes into a given thread, so we're going to multiply this by gamma. And the way this works is as follows. This is the first thread in contact. Let's see the biggest stress from the second. Which sees the biggest stress in the third. And here's what gamma, which I got for power screws. Uh, power screws typically have six, six threads in contact. The first one, the shear, is 0.38. 
I don't precisely remember where I got this from, but these are reasonable numbers. 0.25. So this is about 60 40 uh, in, in terms of share. It drops to 0.15. The next one's 0 0.09, 0 0.10. And the rest, the last two, are 0 0.09. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. So obviously, the first one thread is the one to be concerned about. And we're going to say gamma is 0 0.4. Okay. That's what power. Now, in threads in general, this will happen, and you don't necessarily have six in contacts. And so if you just had two, then you'd put 60% here and 40% ratio of these numbers. Okay. Now, by and large, when you're joining things um, in, say, capstone design, you, you want to try to have uh, about half a dozen threads in contact if you can. After that, it doesn't matter. There are any number of things you meet in life where you only have a couple of threads in contact. Some of the caps on bottles and stuff like that have fewer than six. They've got very light loads. Loads are not really an issue or stress enough. And for A, oh. then, yep. Uh, is there a reason those don't add to one? Oh, this is percentage. This is a fraction. Oh, they, they don't add to one? Okay. Then, then they're, they're, oh, this is because I made a typo. Thank you. I copied it incorrectly. Yeah, thank you. Let me check. You're supposed to add one. 0.25. Yeah, now they add to one. Okay, thank you. Thank you. This was 18 point instead of 15. And for the area, We'll just treat it, the difference between two circles here. Again, this is somewhat approximate, but this is not too bad. So sigma B then, with our choice of gamma equals 0.4, and I multiply by four, I'll get 1.6. That's what sigma B is going to be. Now the bending stress, This is a uniform stress. So in terms of getting the moment, I put a result in force here. Halfway through. The depth of this thing is P upon four, P upon two. So this moment arm is going to be P upon four. So sigma B is M over S and M is the resultant force gamma W, okay, the, the shear times P upon four. Yes, that's kind of a funny beam. <laughs> Beams are supposed to be long relative to their thickness. Well, that the length of this beam is exactly the same as the thickness. So this is somewhat approximate. S in general for a rectangular beam is one six B H squared. H is the height, B is the breadth. The breadth of this beam, it wraps around for a whole circle. So pi dm and H is P upon two. So 
So what's sigma B then? M. Right by S. So I'm going to flip this. P squared. P upon two squared. So you get a four on top. The fours cancel and one of the P's cancel. I'm going to use gamma equals 0.4 again for the first thread, the worst thread. So that's my opinion thread. Well, this is kind of a static loading criterion. Keep your spaces below yield strength. There were some <clears throat> so here at one. Tau max. There's a maximum difference in the principal stresses. Sigma B is going to be positive. Sigma B to be in the beginning. Sigma uppercase B, the bearing stress, is going to be negative. Okay. So it, it's going to be one half sigma B minus sigma B, which will add. So we'll see what that is. Now this is a very stubby beam. And so there is the shear stress in the middle here. And for a rectangular beam, that's 3V upon 2A. V the shear force, which is the shear of the load, gamma W. And A, the area around here is pi dr times the height, which is p upon 2. So this tau max is 3 upon 2 times 0.4. W pi dr p times two, three times point four is one point two. And I've said in the past that for most beams, you can ignore this maximum shear and you get a bigger shear up here due to the bending stress. Okay. This is a very stubby beam, but we do have a compressive stress here. So these two can expect to be comparable. Well, let me, are there any questions on that? Okay, well, let, let me do our C clamp. So just reminding you of the, the specs, D, the outer, was 5 eighths. The root was 15 over 32. This gives a mean 
which we've had before at 35 over 64. And the pitch was 5 over 32. Let's, let's take W as a thousand pounds. And in T, well, we lift that with about 20 pounds. Ballpark would be 60 pound inches. Right, let me go get the core stresses. I'm going to keep using, well, sorry, dr for the inner radius of minus four Let me get the stresses in KSI, so this will be one, one kip. And DR, 15 over 32. Let's see where I About 16 divided by pi. 18 divided by pi. Let's see how that compares with the torsional. Clear stresses. The tau t, the shared rate of torque, was 16 t on pi dr cubed. I'll, I'll work this out in psi to start with and convert to ksi. So I'll put this in, in pound inches. And dr is 15. about 10. I convert it to KSI. So the idea that this is negative compared to this is not typically true. In fact, I'm not sure of the case where it's true. What's the maximum shear you get in this core then? Half of this is very comparable to this. So this stress is going to increase this thing by about 40%. 4.15. You definitely can't ignore core stresses when you're doing this. And you'd want this to be less than or equal to SY upon two. Well, this load, it's well less than that. You have to think about what's the biggest load you'd, you'd lift with this thing and see if, if you're happy with it. Okay. So that would give you some sort of capacity for this, for the core. The compressive stress here is minus 5.79 minus tau max. Sigma two, I should say. Nine point nine four. Quite big. The 
the thread stresses. Sigma B. Again, I'll leave this as tips. So I get my answer in KSI. And D is 5 eighths. And DR was 2.98. The bending stress. This is what's going to make it big. Yet again, bending stresses are significant. Biggest stress we've got yet. Is that 8.94? Yes. Let me recopy that. Go look at candidate maximum shear. Sigma B was negative, so this adds. So that's comparable to the tower max we had before, 4.155.96. So they're comparable here and here, but let's look at what happens at two.
about 16 over pi, 5.21. So even for the stubby beam, because of the compressive stress up here, this is the biggest. Okay. Moreover, this thing has got a stress concentration factor here. Now these stress concentration factors will be quite high, but they'll have a very small region. So you're going to get some local yielding in here. Now it's a little bit hard to say because the region is so small that the yield strength will have gone up okay, because of size effects. So it's not that easy to, to estimate. But on a square, square thread, you can expect some yielding here. The acme threads have slightly less stress concentration there. So when you're looking for the tower max in the threads, then the combination of bending and pressure actually typically wins. That's, you, you might want to check this as well. I think at this point though, you've got all the formulas you need to solve problem set nine. And that's the last of the material we're going to cover uh, this semester. Are there any questions on this before I make some comments about the file? These are all straightforward calculations, just a matter of keeping track of your dimensions and putting them in correctly. Okay. They're fairly simple. These combinations are just like versions or aspects of more circles. Okay, well, later this afternoon, I'm going to post this practice final. And this, this will follow the format of the past finals. This, this is actually the practice final will be the last final I gave for 2019. It'll be almost verbatim. And so this is going to have the first two questions, a 10 part question, and they can be on the entire course. Okay, and so you have nine problem sets. It's reasonable to expect that about six of them will be problem set one, two, three, about six on four, five, six, and about six on seven, eight, nine. Okay. Then you have two more questions, three and four. These are just 10 point questions. They're not made up of 10 parts, they have several parts maybe, and they'll be on problem sets seven, eight, and nine. Okay, um, this final was pretty much all acceptable for you except one thing i did a little differently i did do basic threads that's chapter 10 of the book section one and two which we didn't do and so that removed one of the short answer questions on the other hand this class did less on power screws than you did so i didn't have a question on power screws where you certainly could have okay now, otherwise the really gone this this exam is it's fair game uh, you, you should be able to do all of this. I will eventually post the solution to this. I'll probably post it on Saturday before the finals. Are there any questions about, about the final? Now, we're on, before I open that up, on Wednesday, if you have any questions, that's another opportunity to ask questions about the final. You can ask them now, we can ask them. Okay? But the standard rules are, that don't send me an email asking a question. If you send me an email, I guess in the next couple of days, and I can answer for the entire class, that's okay. But after that, uh, I'm not answering any questions about the final because I'm not doing that for an individual where everybody in the class can't, can't get the answer. Uh, at least everybody that wants to. So uh, I'll have office hours as usual tomorrow and I'll return or go through rather problem set nine on, uh, on Wednesday. And at this point in time, there's no, in my opinion, there's no point introducing further technical material because um, you wouldn't have problems on it. And so then it's not examinable. But it's only stuff that you've got had problems on is examinable. Okay, are there any questions about the final? Uh, would the practice final have all the tables yeah. and graphs we would need? Yes, yes, that's a fair question. Yeah, but as, as previously, this sort of stuff, this sort of material, I attach this. You're, you're not expected to have this on your, on your formula sheets. I would say with your formula sheets, you've got three two-sided sheets. I I felt in the past that sometimes we had when we had three one-sided sheets, it wasn't quite enough, but maybe it would be. Don't feel like you have to fill out six pages of formulas. 
I'm just letting you do that if you need to. Okay, but so that that's it's up to you to have formulas, but material properties and graphs and stuff like that that'll be provided. So here's what was provided in this exam: that you had to select a bearing, so you got the capacity for bearing. Okay, um, you need an application factor, and there was some KFs involved here. And so you had to have the Q factor. Then here is the stress concentration factor. And this is the stuff I said would give you from S and N. So if you need any of the stuff that's here, you may not need it in this exam, but we'll see. It would be provided. <coughs> oh, is it? I see somebody asked, the material from the guest lecture is not on the final, not, it might be implicitly, but not explicitly. Okay, that's a fair question. I want Brent to show you what you can expect in practice using this stuff. I think that's, that's uh, what, more or less what happens. Right? And, and the takeaway from this course is, you know, you've got, the rest of the book with applications, hopefully you understand the material well enough that when you get a new application, you can read the book and see how to put it together. Okay. Most of the applications are pretty good. I'm a little disappointed in the book with your comments about core axial stresses, but you know, it's quite a lengthy book. Anybody can make a mistake. Any other questions? Did you say that there is a topic on the practice test that we will not be covering? No. Any, anything? Oh, oh, sorry, I misunderstood. There is one problem which is removed. It's not on the practice test. One part I. Let's see. I think it was in question two. J. It was a bulk problem, not dealt with, so I didn't put any, I didn't even put it on the practice test. But that wasn't the that's that's from sections 10.1 and 10.2 of the book, which we didn't cover. The reason we didn't cover it is I thought <clears throat> it'd be better to do more on power screws. By and large, when you get to capstone design, you pick threads, you, wittingly or otherwise, you're going to be reverse engineering. You're going to look at what people have used in the past and probably do the same thing. Now it's not a bad idea to read 10. Uh, the first two parts of section 10 to see how to do it. But mo most of the time people click faster and say, well, look at what was used in the past. Yeah. Power screws, on the other hand, are a little more tricky. So the, these people did not have, they had a little bit of power screws. And one of the reasons I left out the, the bolt stuff was so we could do a bit more of power screws, do a bit more complete job. There's still more of power screws, but basically power screws are subject to one-time loading. So getting the static stresses is well on the way to uh, being able to stress our lives, which we did today. But I, everything that's on this test, since I removed that 2J, is, is fair game. Of course, it won't be literally on the final, but the material and the line could be. Any other questions? Okay, well, we'll talk uh, Wednesday. And I have office hours tomorrow at 3 30 to 5 30. If you have questions on problems at uh, 9, or well, for that matter, questions about the material, um, <clears throat> send me an email. Preferably include a phone number so I can call you with an answer. Okay. Have a good day.